Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted that uh, you've all come out on this really historic day. Uh, everyone that I've been speaking with, everyone just has, sort of has a glow about them uh, because of the very historic events of the day uh, in Washington, obviously uh, something we're all going to remember a long time. And uh, we're delighted that uh, we're going to be able to continue the events this evening uh, to discuss a really important subject and one that I'm sure is going to be very high on the list for, I can't say president-elect anymore, President Obama, uh, and that is China, the relationship between the United States and China, and obviously a great deal of that uh, is going to depend on domestic developments in China and the paths uh, that China chooses uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center uh, for International Understanding, and I'm pinch hitting this evening uh, for Professor Daryl Press, uh, who's the director of the War and Peace Studies program uh, at the Dickey Center. But uh, I don't know, you know, uh, if you know, Daryl is married to Professor Jenny Lin, and they have two young children. Uh, Jenny is traveling at a conference, and Daryl lost their babysitter this evening. So uh, I'm pinch, pinch hitting for Daryl with, uh, with pleasure. This is the third talk in a year-long series organized by the War and Peace Studies program, uh, and it's entitled uh, The Rise of China. <clears throat> So far during this program, we've heard from Professor John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago about the growth of China's economic power and, in his view, the coming competition between Beijing and Washington for supremacy in East Asia, and obviously the possibility that it could lead to conflict, not necessarily, uh, but possibly based on historical record. Then last week, we heard from Professor Edward Steinfeld from uh, MIT, who spoke about China's economic reforms and the challenges that China will face uh, as it becomes one of the world's true economic powerhouses. And on February 4th, just two weeks from tomorrow, uh, we'll hear from Professor Ralph Thaxton, and Ralph is sitting right back here uh, to my right, uh, a visiting fellow at the Dickey Center this year from Rutgers University, uh, who will speak on the vast internal pressures that China faces and uh, discuss whether the current Chinese government can survive the coming decades and the chaos we will face if it does not. But that's jumping ahead. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Minxin Pei, a senior associate in the China program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And at a faculty lunch today, we had a fascinating discussion uh, about corruption. When I think it's going to be one of the central uh, topics of uh, Dr. Pei's uh, talk, and it will be a very interesting one, I can guarantee you. Dr. Pei is one of uh, this country's leading experts on China's ongoing domestic reforms, the prospects for democratization in China, and U.S.-Chinese relations. He is the author of two books. The first is China's Trapped Transition, The Limits of Developmental Autocracy, and the second is Reform From Reform to Revolution, the Demise of Communism in China and the Soviet Union. He's also written numerous articles and outlets such as Foreign Affairs, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Financial Times, Newsweek, and the latest, if I recall correctly, is in Forbes magazine, uh, again dealing with uh, corruption uh, in China. Uh, after his talk, Dr. Pei will answer questions uh, and as usual, at uh, Dartmouth events sponsored by the Dickey Center, we always give students 
um, first first shot first shot at the questions. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Minchin Pei. Dr. Pei. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ken. I also want to thank the Dickey Center and Dartmouth College for giving me the honor to speak here tonight. This is obviously a historic uh, occasion, and uh, somebody asked me, why aren't you in Washington? Uh, I said, Dartmouth is m much more fun. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 if you don't notice this, this might be one of the official programs for celebrating the inauguration of President Obama. We all know he's an intellectual, so why not doing something really intellectual on the day he officially becomes our president? Uh, and the title of the talk here is uh, uh, Why Economic Development Has Not Led to Democratization in China. Uh, the future of China uh, is really one of the uh, uh, major, uh, the most important variables uh, that the world faces. Uh, if you look at a whole gamut of issues from climate change to regional security to China's role in the global economy and to the future cause of freedom, China is a huge piece of the puzzle. Without China, you cannot get the right answer or you cannot get any answer. So I think if you want to uh, ask a question about China's future, either its economic prosperity or its political future, I would, from my perspective, I would per, per pick China's political future because uh, political scientists all want to uh, believe that politics decides everything. So uh, here uh, tonight, uh, we're going to uh, answer this very basic question. Uh, this, uh, why, despite such impressive economic uh, progress over the last 30 years, China has not taken substantive steps toward democratization. Uh, first, give you, uh, let me give you some numbers. Uh, uh, if you have not uh, uh, read uh, this piece of news, you, uh, you should now uh, know that China just uh, last year, uh, not two years ago, 07, China passed Germany as the world's third largest economy. And this year, uh, Chinese per capita GDP is going to reach 3,000. Uh, uh, but 30 years ago, things did not look very promising. Uh, at that time, China's, uh, the t total size of chi the Chinese economy was uh, roughly a quarter of a trillion dollars, 250 billion. Today, it is this year, it's going to be 3.7 trillion. So we're talking about 14 times larger. And per capita income, just as I said, this year it will, uh, 08, it, will, uh, it was 3,000. Uh, 1978, it was less than 250. Again, a, a, a huge expansion of uh, economic prosperity. But when you look at the Chinese political system, you, of course, there's one way you uh, try to measure the degree of freedom in a country, and you can uh, use the so-called the Freedom Index. The Freedom House publishes an index every year. It goes back uh, many, many years. There's a parallel uh, data set called Polity, Polity 2, which measures more or less the same thing. The two data sets uh, are highly correlated. But if you look at either data set, you would find that China's freedom score has not really increased that much. It's stuck in 14, 13. The higher the number, the less free a country is. Uh, the, the US and other countries are like one or two. So China has been stuck in this unfree zone for the last 30 years. So how do we explain this uh, paradox? Because according to standard theory that explains the relationship between economic development and political change, there ought to be some uh, progress. 
uh, in terms of political democratization in China. Uh, of course, there are, there are people who will challenge the assertion that China has not made political progress. They will say, China today is obviously less repressive than China was 30 years ago. That point I definitely concede. But does it mean that China today is more politically democratic? There's a fundamental difference between individual freedom, personal freedom on the one hand, and political democracy on the other. The political democracy really involves the exercise of popular power in decision making, in political affairs. And that, on that front, clearly, China is not a country where people freely, competitively participate in political decision making. Uh, its government is not elected. It does not have, while we go down this sort of checklist of what qualifies as a democracy, whether there are free elections, this is the most important. No, there are no free elections. The government is not elected. The government is self-perpetuating. A, uh, 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 A, B, does China have uh, multi-political parties? No, there's only one party, uh, the Communist Party. Uh, and does China have genuine media freedom? China has a more free media today, but I would not concede that China has a free media. There's a difference between uh, having more freedom in the media vis-a-vis -vis 30 years ago versus having absolute freedom in the media. And China certainly does not have an independent judiciary. China does not have uh, freedom of association. Uh, you cannot have independent religious organizations. You cannot have independent labor unions. And for students in this room, you cannot have independent student unions. So if you go down this list, that would uh, tell you whether a country has the basic requirements, institution, civic, or uh, uh, political, uh, for having a democracy, then China clearly does not. But it's, this does not mean that Chinese society as a whole is becoming freer for its members. Uh, a lot of you must have been to China. Uh, if you go to Chinese colleges, the students uh, are fairly free. Uh, they listen to the kind of music you listen to. Uh, they uh, visit uh, internet websites uh, almost without restriction. And uh, their lifestyle uh, uh, is uh, also very, very free. Uh, so there's this difference we have to bear in mind, a very important distinction we have to make. Indi individual liberties do not qualify a country uh, uh, as having a democratic system. We have to look at the key political institutions and its system systemic features. Uh, so this is, uh, I, uh, so to those who say that China has made political progress, I say China has made enormous progress in expanding the zone of freedom for individual freedom for its people. But on, uh, on the front of political change, on the front of allowing competitive politics to emerge, China has fallen very, very far behind. And this is, uh, very, uh, uh, this is especially striking if you compare China with other countries. Uh, if you, again, if you go to China and raise the issue of democracy, two, other than those who say, oh, China has made political progress, you're likely to hear two arguments. One is that China is too big, too many people. It's very hard to have the, functioning democracy in a very large country with a lot of people, but of course you, you are going to say, what about India? So uh, the other argument, which is uh, probably uh, on the surface quite convincing or persuasive, is that China is too poor. 30 years ago, I would say that may be the case. But today, uh, if you look at the freedom score, you will find this very strange phenomenon. That is, China actually is wealthier than 130 countries in the world in per capita income, in terms of per, cap per capita income. Uh, 3,000 in US dollar, uh, 
exchange rate uh, measurements. But if uh, the measure they use is so-called purchasing power parity, China is about 5,000. There are about 190 countries in the world. China ranks about 132. That means that there are about 60 countries wealthier than China and 130 countries less wealthy in China in terms of per capita income. And if you look at 130 countries that are less wealthy than China, what you find, you find almost 80 countries, 79. 79 countries that are freer politically than China. Their freedom score is on average eight. China's freedom score is 13. So they are roughly twice as free as China. Uh, uh, and, uh, but their per capita income, average per capita income, is half of China's per capita income. Uh, their average per capita income is roughly $2,500 in PPP terms. So that you can, based on that evidence, 79 countries, a lot poorer, half as wealthy, but twice as free, you cannot use the poverty argument to justify the lack of political democracy in China. So what happened? How do we explain the fact that, on the one hand, you have uh, enormous economic progress? Per capita income rose 12 times. The size of GDP grew 14 times. And at the same time, China is falling behind uh, the score of political freedom. Is the theory wrong? Because the standard theory called liberal theory of political evolution uh, 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 argues that economic change will bring about political freedom. Let me propose a different kind of theory, which actually is gaining uh, importance uh, in the study of uh, the development of democracy. This is a theory about elite decision making. Unlike the theory that, connect, uh, that says that economic progress is the key driver of political change, uh, the theory that looks at political elites claims that economic forces may be important. But at the end of the day, whether to introduce democratic reforms is the decision that is made by political elites. So we have to look at how political elites deal with economic change, where the political elites themselves are willing to introduce democratic change. So uh, this is the elite perspective. Uh, uh, and I find that the elite perspective more persuasive in explaining uh, why China has fallen behind vis-a-vis -vis other poor developing countries in uh, introducing democratic uh, development. Uh, of course, uh, economic growth will lead to uh, positive political change in the long run. But of course, you know in the long run we're all dead. That's why I think we have to focus at the short to medium run. And the argument I'm making in this uh, lecture is that in the short to medium run, uh, in the short to medium run, economic progress actually has a negative impact on the prospect of democratic change. This is very different from the standard theory. And why would I make this almost a counterintuitive uh, argument? Uh, the reasons, once I explain this, you will say, aha, it's so simple. Uh, the first one is quite simple and I would say intuitive. That is, economic growth, uh, economic growth by itself delivers uh, improvement in the welfare of individuals. And that, for an authoritarian leadership, provides a source of legitimacy. So you can say economic progress becomes a source of legitimacy for an authoritarian government, which then uh, is not uh, compelled to introduce democratic change. Uh, that obviously uh, is quite self-evident. And indeed, when you look at uh, the history of economic reform, uh, you, uh, 
the history of economic change and political progress in terms of democracy, you find that the standard theory uh, is wrong uh, because the standard theory claims that there's a parallel progress, economic progress and political pro progress. But when you look at the actual history of how democracies in developing countries came into being, you, found, you will find just the opposite. You find that whenever regimes that, uh, whenever authoritarian regimes do well economically, they lose all the incentives to introduce democratic reforms. On the other hand, most of the new democracies came into existence in countries that were economic disasters. In other words, only when authoritarian regimes were unable to deliver economic growth would they lose political legitimacy. So uh, economic success does not equate political progress. In fact, economic success tends to block political progress. And here, somebody might say, what about South Korea and Taiwan or Chile? I would say these are the exceptions that prove the rule. You have to look at more than 70 countries that became democratic in the last 35 years. How many of them actually was economically successful cases? A tiny minority. <laughs> in fact, outside East Asia, I challenge you to come up with more than 10 examples. I can only come up with about five or six at most. So that's why I think there is, in empirical terms, a very negative correlation between economic success and uh, political democracy. That's because economic success provides a source of legitimacy for the rulers and removes the pressure from society for these countries to uh, democratize. The second reason that economic progress tends to slow down uh, political democracy uh, is a little bit, uh, 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 has not been mentioned uh, the, in uh, the existing literature. That has to do with the value of political power. When authoritarian leaders decide whether to open up the political process, they make a calculation. And that calculation depends on how valuable political power is. The more valuable the political power, the less willing they are going to part with political power. This is a very uh, obvious uh, rule. What happens in a society that is authoritarian politically, but economically very dynamic, economic growth is very fast, what happens is that all of a sudden, political power becomes more valuable. Because in an authoritarian society, political power can be used to convert political, convert itself into economic wealth. Because authoritarian rulers are not subject to the rule of law, and they can abuse their power through corruption, through other means to enrich themselves. So all of a sudden, when the economic pie is growing, not only it delivers an alternative source of political legitimacy, but it also makes the leaders realize that their power is more valuable. They are less willing to give up political power. That's why when you look at the history of China, you find this, this irony. In the 1980s, the Chinese Communist Party was actually actively exploring the possibility of political reform. They convened a task force headed by the party's, uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party to discuss how China could democratize. And in those days, the Chinese economy was a fraction of the size it is today. And Chinese per capita income was much lower. But the Communist Party was willing to think about opening up the political process. So, but today, when you, again, so look at uh, how the Chinese elites are thinking. The other day I read in the Chinese press, the third most powerful uh, person in the Chinese Communist Party 
openly declared that China will never adopt a multi-party system. China will never be a Western-style democracy. Uh, the Communist Party will always maintain its rule. And then you look at the discourse, the political discourse. No more discussion on political reform. Political reform, in other words, has almost become a political dirty word for the Chinese Communist Party. So uh, these two examples would confirm my hypothesis that the difference is in economic uh, wealth. Economic wealth now makes Chinese leaders much less willing to entertain the idea of political reform. So this is the second reason, at the micro level, uh, why, how individuals in that system become much more defensive about uh, maintaining the monopoly of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and the third uh, cause uh, that were, the third reason that economic progress is actually a negative uh, for political uh, progress is that we often forget that authoritarian leaders themselves are clever human beings. Uh, and they know how to adapt. If you, you have to think about politics now uh, in terms of evolution, because it, the key concept of evolution is adaptation. And political organizations, political regimes, uh, all adapt to the changing environment. And in the static theory that connects economic uh, modernization, with uh, political democracy, they forget this key variable, is that how do authoritarian leaders themselves devise new strategies of survival? And if you look at China after Tiananmen, the key change in China, that China after Tiananmen went in a very different direction. I mean, China before Tiananmen was actually doing something that would prove the theory. But after Tiananmen, China went off in a, what I would call a new authoritarian direction. The adaptation in this case is not liberal adaptation. The standard theory claims that regimes, authoritarian regimes, will respond to rising middle class, uh, greater inter interdependence with the international community, and practice a more liberal politics. But the opposite can also be true. That in face of a rising middle class, in face of greater interdependence with the global economy, the authoritarian rulers themselves can actually devise very ingenious strategies to uh, have it both ways, to enjoy the fruits of economic prosperity while protecting their political monopoly at the same time. So this process is what I would call illiberal adaptation. It is made possible by economic prosperity because it cannot, this kind of adaptation requires enormous resources. Uh, the authoritarian rulers themselves have to have increasing tax revenues in order to practice this new strategy of survival. So what does this strategy consist of? It has two elements, what I call a two-pronged strategy. One element uh, is uh, a much more effective, much more sophisticated, much more efficient way of repression. China today is repressive, but it is not practicing mass repression. China today you practices what I would call selective repression. It is very different from societies such as North Korea or Saddam's Iraq or Mao's China where repression was indiscriminate. Everybody was a victim or still in those societies that practice it, is a victim of repression. But today, the Chinese government only targets very specific groups. And it targets these groups with a much more sophisticated level of technology, much more uh, heavy investment. Uh, let me just give you some examples. One of the lessons the Chinese Communist Party learned from the Tiananmen Square tobacco was that China did not have a well-organized, well-trained, well-equipped anti-right police force. So it had to send in the army. At that time, I heard they did not even have uh, tear gas. Uh, 
to disperse the crowds, so they had to use tanks. Uh, so after Tiananmen, the government invested a huge sum of money to equip, train, and maintain a very large anti-riot police force. The number is roughly, it's a secret, but the estimate is between quarter of a million to half a million. And that's a huge uh, uh, anti-riot uh, police force. And now, whenever there are riots, demonstrations, it's the government sends in this elite force. And it, uh, so over the uh, past 10 years, China has seen a lot of riots. Every, on average, uh, China has about 80 to, 80 to 90,000 riots a year. But these riots, each time uh, when they uh, take place, uh, are suppressed very quickly. They do not lead to uh, nationwide uh, political instability. Uh, and the other example I really like to, uh, uh, I often like to quote, uh, use is uh, the, in the control of the internet. It requires re enormous investment in technology, in training. The internet police alone is supposed to uh, have uh, more than 30,000 people. Uh, and you have to constantly upgrade the technology, train the right people. Uh, and without uh, the adequate tax resources, you cannot maintain this kind of sophisticated uh, system of uh, information control. Uh, the other uh, component of this illiberal adaptation strategy is much more subtle. I call this social co-optation. And this is, again, based on the lesson from Tiananmen and from the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And it, to have this strategy successful, you have to have a lot of money. Uh, what, uh, how, do, uh, how do authoritarian regimes get overthrown? In our popular imagination, we believe that these dictatorships are overthrown by peasants, by workers. We have this romantic notion of revolutions overthrowing uh, repressive regimes. If you look at the history, that's not true. Authoritarian regimes are overthrown by other social elites, by disaffected, smart people who are not at the table, who are not part of the ruling coalition. And the Communist Party is very clever. Uh, it looked at how the Soviet Union collapsed, how uh, what uh, political forces were responsible for the 1989 Tiananmen Square pro-democracy movement, and it came to this conclusion. These were intellectuals. These were urban professionals. These are the new middle class. So if you want to prevent a coalition from emerging, and that coalition consists of so-called counter-elites, new social elites, you have to bribe these new, so new social elites. You have to give them all kinds of reasons for not being in the opposition. So in the 1990s, you see a very dramatic change in the Communist Party's policy toward the urban intelligentsia, toward the, uh, the professionals, and toward college students. In the 1980s, the, communi the Communist Party did practically everything to alienate the intelligentsia. Uh, it did not give them political access. Uh, it did not recruit them into the Communist Party. And it kept their salaries very, very low. Uh, but starting in the 1990s, the Communist Party implemented a systematic program to recruit college students into the Communist Party. I have uh, data. Uh, before the 1990s, only 2% of college students were Communist Party members. Today, at least 10%. And it also began to recruit professors into the Communist Party and giving them political appointments. Uh, if you go to China and see the, their name cards, you'll find something very strange. A mayor will also... Uh, a mayor, he will, first of all, he's likely to be PhD. And then you turn around, he's also holding some professorships uh, in some colleges. 
Uh, and then you, if, if you ask him about his background, it turns out that not too long ago, he was indeed teaching at some colleges uh, as a full-time professor. In other words, the government very successfully uh, co-opted the urban intelligentsia, especially uh, the uh, professionals into its ranks. And it not only uh, uh, has given them political uh, appointments, it ho has also increased uh, the level of uh, compensation, the level of uh, 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 the amount of benefits, uh, perks to the Chinese uh, intelligentsia. Uh, the calculation is very cynical. The more you have to lose, the less likely you are going to risk losing. <laughs> so in the 1980s, uh, the urban intelligentsia really had very little to lose. They were not part of a regime. Uh, they were poorly paid. Uh, so they constantly uh, challenged the Chinese Communist Party. But starting in the 1990s, if you want to challenge the Chinese Communist Party, if you want to be a dissident, you actually have to worry about losing your house, losing your uh, passport, losing your privileges, you're losing your uh, 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 position, uh, losing your pay. So it's the difference. It's not like night and day. The 1980s, the intelligentsia organized several very large-scale anti-regime movements. Since the 1990s, none. You cannot find any significant social movement led by the urban intelligentsia. So in other words, this social cooperation has been remarkably successful. And in political terms, it has, a pre uh, it has done what I would call political, political decapitation. It has removed a, the most capable uh, segment of the population from playing a leadership role uh, in Chinese society in any movement against the Chinese Communist Party. And another social group, the Chinese Communist Party, has tried to co-opt, but with less success, is private entrepreneurs. Although the Chinese Communist Party uh, has begun to recruit entrepreneurs into the uh, system, uh, into the political uh, uh, establishment, uh, private entrepreneurs remain quite worried about the Communist Party. That's because private entrepreneurs themselves have prob private property to protect, and the Communist Party is not really uh, to be trusted for protecting private property. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the sort of the post Tiananmen Chinese system. Uh, you, can un you can see now it is really a very sophisticated system. It is not your average uh, repressive authoritarian uh, regime. The leadership itself is very well educated. Uh, actually, the leadership uh, is very well traveled. Uh, they, uh, they are very different from the leadership in the 1980s. Uh, most of them uh, have been abroad. Their children uh, have been educated abroad, and they know uh, quite well about Western society. But at the same time, this is a leadership that is just as determined as their predecessors in defending the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. So the, uh, the question we have to ask after explaining uh, the setup of this system is, can this strategy last? What are the weak points in this strategy? Uh, if the, because the implications are enormous. If the Chinese Communist Party's survival strategy is going to be effective for, for, for a long time, then I think we have to uh, think about American foreign policy toward China. Because the American foreign policy, as you know, is very moralistic, is very ideological. It often, uh, sees countries governed by dictatorships as existential threat to American security and to American influence. So if China, which will be the world's second largest economy in about five years, if the current rate of growth continues, then 
uh, we have to, uh, I think we have a much more serious uh, uh, potential adversary to deal with. But I think after explaining how successful, how sophisticated the strategy is, I think I want to uh, end this talk with some more optimistic uh, observations about the future of democracy in China and about uh, the, the eventual ideological and political bankruptcy of autocracy uh, in China. Uh, before I start giving you my reasons, let me just share with you one simple observation. Uh, if authoritarian regimes are so resilient, so adaptive, so smart, how come that all the most successful countries in the world are all democracies? So the fact that the most successful countries in the world are not dictatorships tells us something that uh, tells us something about authoritarian regimes. They m must have, in other words, the, their system must have some inherent limitations that prevent these dictatorships from becoming truly great powers. And here I, I give you four reasons uh, why uh, this successful strategy that has seen the Communist Party through very difficult times since the 1980s is actually not going to be uh, tenable uh, forever. Now for another 20 years, I, if I have to uh, put my 401k on the line, <laughs> I would say that uh, probably next 10 years, we're going to see the unraveling of this strategy. The first one is that all of this really depends on the Communist Party's ability to maintain high rates of economic growth. And we know that e maintaining high rates of economic growth is not that easy, especially if you are a globally connected economy. The Chinese economy is closely connected with the global commerce. Today, exports and imports account for 70% of China's GDP. So it's enormously trade dependent. So to, uh, when the US is now in a recession, the global financial crisis has plunged the world economy into a recession, Chinese economic growth has fallen like a piece of rock. Uh, it was growing at 12% or seven. Last year, it was going to be 8%. This year, you will be very lucky to achieve 6%. So you can, um, uh, if you, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but last week I understand Professor Steinfeld was here, uh, and he might give you some reasons to uh, believe that China's economic growth cannot maintain its current pace. So in other words, when economic growth slows down, the ability of this regime to use the fruits of economic growth to maintain its patronage system to uh, continue to finance a very costly selective repressive system to continue to co-op social elites will be severely limited. So the second reason why authoritarian regimes eventually unravel is that it suffers from two critical weaknesses, one of which is corruption, because authoritarian regimes are inherently corrupt. It has to rule by corruption. It has to maintain the loyalty of its uh, followers by giving them special privileges. Uh, and of course, corruption delegitimizes the regime. It, it's one of the uh, things that rally different groups in China against the Communist Party. The other weaknesses of authoritarian regimes is, is inequality. If the, uh, and Today, China's economic growth, even though it is very high, is producing a level of income inequality that is approaching Latin American levels. If you look at uh, roughly uh, inequality, the level of inequality grows up by something like 1% a year. So over 30 uh, years, Chinese inequality has, the level of inequality has increased by 30%. Uh, 
At the current rate, it will surpass the level of inequality in Mexico in about five years. And inequality has all kinds of negative impact on uh, uh, Chinese society, on economic growth, and of course, on the Chinese government, because this is a government that is a strange mixture. It has a very leftist ideology. It still calls itself the Communist Party. If, if you look at the Communist Party's charter, uh, it professes all kinds of leftist ideas, in, uh, equality, state ownership, welfare society. But if you look at the actual policies of the Chinese Communist Party, they are more Republican than the most diehard Republicans. Because China is a country that does not allow labor unions, that has no capital gains tax, that has no uh, inheritance tax that has no property tax. I think the Republicans would love to bring the Communist Party in to run this country. Uh, well, maybe after Obama, they can all seek political asylum in China. Uh, so uh, inequality, that's, uh, I think, uh, if, you, if the trend of inequality continues, you're definitely going to see a much higher level of social instability uh, within China. And the third reason to be optimistic about the future of democracy in China is that if you look at the strategy of social cooperation, you'll find an inherent limitation because authoritarian regimes are by nature exclusive. They're clubs. So they cannot, at the end of the day, co-opt everybody. At the same time, the speed at which the Chinese society produces social elites is very fast. A lot more people today in China have college educations, have graduate school educations, are entrepreneurs. So the Communist Party, at the end of the day, will not be able to get everybody into its club. So people will be left out. And the people who are left out will constitute a new source of political change. And finally, let's give some credit to the classic theory of economic progress and political change. Even though political elites themselves are unwilling to introduce democracy or to allow democratic changes, Chinese society is not waiting. China's new middle class is not waiting. So there is this new and very encouraging phenomenon, uh, which I call civic activism, that is, Growing numbers of average Chinese, mostly in urban areas, are now becoming politically assertive. They want better uh, environmental protection. They want uh, their opinions to be consulted uh, when major pu public policies are made, even though uh, these people understand that they are not going to challenge the Communist Party uh, uh, in a uh, face-to-face uh, -face fashion. They're not going to say the Communist Party is uh, illegitimate. The Communist Party has to allow political, other political parties. They are simply challenging the Communist Party at its weakest point. Part of the legitimacy of the Communist Party is competence, is that I rule because I can. Today, China's new middle class is challenging the I can part because it is showing, they are showing that the Communist Party actually can't. The Communist Party cannot provide adequate and accessible health care for most Chinese people. The Communist Party cannot provide good education for the Chinese people. The Communist Party cannot provide good environmental, satisfactory environmental protection. So these areas of public policy have become increasingly open. And I would guess that over the long run, they, they will become the entry points through which Chinese uh, society will find itself growing increasingly empowered. Uh, and that's why uh, I would say uh, at the end of the day, the Communist Party has had a very good run, but uh, it's not going to be, uh, uh, it's good luck, probably will run out within 10 years. But I cannot imagine its good luck will not run out in 20 years. Uh, I, have, uh, uh, I have time for, uh, for your questions. Thank you.
Is there a microphone or two? Professor, what's your take on the school of thought espoused by people like Daniel Bell, who say that the system of Western liberal values cannot necessarily be transported to places like China because there is like East Asian values or Confucian values that mean that any system of governance that ought to work in that part of the world um, need to, needs to have a form of Chinese flair or something different. Like that liberal democracy doesn't work in places like China. What's your opinion on that school of thought, and what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, Chinese people are no different from Western people in terms of some very basic human needs and human values. They want dignity. They don't want. They want property to be protected. They want a say in how their countries are run, even though they may have a higher level of trust in their government's ability to solve problems. Uh, so uh, to that extent, I would dispute the notion that there is a distinct Asian strain of political values. Uh, at the same time, you look at how democracies are practiced in Chinese societies. They are really vibrant. Uh, they are uh, uh, probably more vibrant than, democ uh, than how democracy is pr practiced in, Western, uh, uh, in the Western world. If you look at Taiwan, if you look at I mean, Hong Kong, even though uh, uh, there's limited democracy, uh, these are all Chinese societies. Uh, elections are fiercely contested. They have opposition parties, and uh, uh, they, uh, they all want uh, a high level of public participation in key public policy making. So I would not uh, uh, really take kindly uh, the sort of the East is always different. Uh, it's a very easy way of finding an excuse uh, for not introducing the kind of political change we all like to see. Yes. Yes. Oh. oh. Um, the the authoritarian and capitalism capitalist development in China is definitely a unique and profound model of growth um, other than South Korea, which had a very planned economy as well. Um, would you say that the free index pointing to Hong Kong as one of the freest economies in the world undermines the authoritarian slash economic growth model of development? Is, uh, are you saying Hong Kong is non-democratic? Uh, well, Hong Kong's a, one has one of the freest economies in the world. Yeah, but also, the uh, economic development model has a lot of uh, appeal to uh, people in developing countries. Uh, they tend to believe that a stronger government can mobilize the resources, can have the discipline, can build, make the investments that cannot be politically done in the uh, developing uh, in developing democracies, uh, Hong Kong is a good example. But Hong Kong is so unique that uh, even though you uh, you can use it to repudiate the authoritarian development, or uh, uh, the thesis that authoritarianism is good for development. I mean, Hong Kong first of all uh, did not have democracy, but Hong Kong always had the rule of law. Uh, Statistical studies show that r the rule of law is more important than democracy in encouraging economic development. And Hong Kong, of course, is just so small. It's, uh, it's populated by a self-selected group, very entrepreneurial. Uh, am I uh, but, asking your uh, answer? Well, Hong Kong on its own, it, it developed. But I'm talking more about the influence that um, Chinese businessmen registered in Hong Kong instead of China, and that, that caused a lot of economic growth in China. So do you think that could have happened if Chinese businessmen did not have the opportunity to first go to Hong Kong 
Do you think it could have just happened in China under that type of government? So you, let's just do a thought experiment, China without Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the outcome of that thought experiment is that China will not be able to grow as fast. I mean, China will do very well. Uh, China would have done well, but China would not have done as well without Hong Kong. Because if you look at uh, the role of Hong Kong in China's economic development, it's really not just multifaceted, it's critical in bringing in what the Chinese uh, government does not have. The Chinese government does not have, uh, did not have in the 80s knowledge about the outside world. Hong Kong business people brought in. And in the 1990s, China did not have functioning financial institutions. And Hong Kong became a market on which the Chinese, uh, on which Chinese firms raised money. And Chinese uh, developers in China really did not know how to build uh, good property. Uh, but if you go to China today, and of course, suppose you've been to Hong Kong, you find that Chinese shopping malls all look like Hong Kong shopping malls because uh, the Hong Kong developers all develop these. So the role of Hong Kong is enormous. And I just want to say something in addition. Many Sioux world dictatorships aspire to be another China. And my joke to them is that find a Hong Kong first. <laughs> Without Hong Kong, you really cannot be another China. Um, during your lecture, you drew up an interesting parallel between China and India. Um, so one of my questions is that there's a lot of similarities in that, especially especially the um, the ethnic groups. Um, Ch both China and India has a lot of ethnic groups, and we do see a lot of, with, aside from the United States, a lot of um, sectarian conflict within democracies, um, especially when a lot of these groups coexist. Um, and in India especially, there just recently, I mean, there's a lot of violence going on, in, especially in northern India. How do you see Tibet and a lot of, you know, the Muslims um, in India coexisting with uh, the Han majority in a, China. In, a, in, a, in a democratic China? And how do you see China handling that? Uh, now you are thinking way into the future. Uh, at the moment, um, China is a diverse society, but China sh is different from other ethnically diverse societies in that China has one overwhelmingly dominant ethnic group, the Han Chinese people like me, 91% of the population. Uh, but China also has the misfortune of having two ethnic groups concentrated in two regions that make up roughly 60% of China's territory, landmass. The Tibetans and the Muslims, the, the Uyghur Muslims the, being the uh, uh, most dominant ethnic group in Xinjiang. Under authoritarian rule, ethnic conflict can be kept uh, under control by sheer repression. Uh, there's no overt, no large-scale violence in China today. But we, we all know that that's because of a high level of repression. If you go to Xinjiang, if you go to Tibet, uh, the level of political control is much higher than elsewhere in China. That's because of the ethnic tensions. So let's roll fast forward, say 20 years from now, China is about to become a democracy. What will happen? to ethnic relations. Dealing with ethnic relations will be the most difficult challenge for a future democratic China. Because the moment of, democ the moment of democratization presents a rare opportunity for long repressed ethnic groups to break out. And if you look at Serbia, of the former Soviet Union, they all want to break out. They even want to break out into, uh, in Quebec. <laughs> uh, so that, and the moment of ethnic breakout is also a moment of internal war. Because the, uh, the, my, uh, the majority groups want to keep 
the territory, not necessarily the people in within the country. And so think about Tibet and Xinjiang, envisioning China <coughs> without Tibet, without Xinjiang, what would, be, what would China look like? So I think that uh, the, we are really looking at a very the difficult, very dangerous scenario of ethnic, very intense ethnic violence and conflict the moment China becomes democratic. A quick follow-up yeah. question to that. Um, then would, not, would that not be a reason for the Han majority to uh, sort of go along with the communist rule right now in, or, in order to perpetuate? What you're saying is what the Chinese majority, uh, Han majority people are thinking. So uh, when Tibet flared up last March, in the West, the sympathy was overwhelmingly toward the Tibetans among the Han Chinese. They were saying, how come the government was so weak? Let's use more, <laughs> more <laughs> force. Uh, so it's, uh, it's sad. I mean, this is just, but it's a fact of life. Just kind of a, an additional follow-up on that. Why does the Chinese government feel so threatened by these minority groups if they're only 10% of the population? And in addition, as I understand it, the territory that they live in is relatively resource poor and inaccessible for most uses. Uh, first of all, China. Uh, China is one of the f sort of a uh, few probably the only surviving multi-ethnic empire. It's, it's imperial because it, it has large groups of populations that are unwi fundamentally unwilling to be part of a country, and that's, the, uh, that's its problem. So the Chinese obsession throughout history is to maintain the integrity of this imperial system. Uh, and f as far as the minorities are cons uh, concerned, they are worried about, the Chinese government is worried about these things. A, if you let one minority go, what about the other minorities? So there's a domino effect. And B, if you look at uh, uh, concentration, ethnic situation, uh, uh, ethnic, the ethnic problem becomes most difficult to deal with when they are concentrated territorially. The U.S. is a very diverse uh, society in terms of this. There's no concentration of a particular group in a particular region. Suppose all uh, the Hispanics move to Texas. 90% of the people pass a referendum and want to go back to Mexico. That's a difficult thing for us to handle, right? Uh, but in China, uh, other than this, you look at the resources. Tibet controls China's water. All China's major rivers begin in the Tibetan Plateau. So if they, ca they can literally block the water and the rest of China will die of <laughs> drought. Xinjiang has China's largest energy reserves. So you, uh, there you, it's, uh, the, so if you cannot really think of China, if you are, Han Chinese. I mean, luckily, I'm not Chinese American, so I'm half Han Chinese. I can think both ways. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine China without. So, the, but there is a solution. As, as I said, ethnic, uh, uh, the ethnic, ethnic problem is the most difficult uh, political problem for any society. Authoritarian regimes are inherently incapable of solving ethnic problems other than repression. Democracies have a hard time, that, but the only solutions, long-lasting political solutions, are found under democratic conditions. So, in other words, even though the moment of democratization in China will be most likely the moment of the fascist movement, but should China genuinely become a democracy, it actually will have the political resources to resolve the Tibetan issue and the Xinjiang issue. I'm going to break my own rule here yeah. and ask a question. Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned before rule of law. Yes. 
and I wanted to probe you on that and to ask whether or not there have been improvements and whether you know, the authoritarian regime has had enough flexibility you know, to introduce certain elements of stability and transparency that way to maintain power. And the second element you haven't mentioned at all, and that's nationalism. Yes. And I wonder if you could address that. Okay. Uh, I actually spend quite a bit of my professional time working on uh, the rule of law uh, issue in China. For a while, I saw China was going down a very promising path of introducing legal reforms. In fact, I interviewed for a job at Dartmouth 11 years ago, and my job talk was about the rule of law in China. Uh, uh, maybe I didn't get a job, and the rule of law in China collapsed. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, two observations. One is that the government in Beijing clearly understood that economic reform requires the rule of law. Uh, you really need, at a very technical level, good laws, uh, a good legal system to, pr to make commerce uh, more smooth, more productive. Uh, very early on, so they focused on developing uh, and putting in place a system of commercial litigation. Uh, when uh, China came out of the cultural region, the country had fewer than 100 laws. Today, China has about 500 laws. So China had a very bare legal or rudimentary legal system today. It has a, a much better legal system in technical terms. So in technical terms, uh, the Chinese legal system has come a long way. Judges are better trained. Uh, there are more laws on the books. There, there are more procedures. Uh, and there are more lawyers. There are more cases. Uh, every year, about 5 million uh, civil cases are handled in the legal system. So in that sense, it's extremely in, uh, encouraging. However, rule of law has its limits. You look at where the rule of law comes into clash with China's authoritarian political system. It's who appoints the judges? Because the Communist Party wants to have it both ways. It wants to have a system it can control. It also wants to have a system which can inspire confidence. You really cannot have both. Because a system that's controlled by politicians does not inspire confidence. So the Communist Party draws the line on who appoints the judges. It insists it appoints the judges. So the judges cannot really rule impartially. And then uh, how uh, will the legal, the court system uh, uh, function as part of the governing system? Because in the US and in other Western democracies, it's more or less independent. It has its own budgets. Uh, it's not answerable to uh, politicians in most cases. But in this country, there are judges who are elected. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, more or less, I think, a Western legal system is in independent. But in, in this case, uh, in the Chinese case, courts are controlled by local governments. Uh, and then, are there cases the courts are allowed to handle? There are certain cases the courts are not allowed to handle. For example, uh, courts are not allowed to handle constitutional cases. Go to a court and say that this act or this policy by the Chinese government is unconstitutional. If the courts can take such cases, I think people will go there and sue the government for the one child policy, right? How can you? And you can go to the court and seek, force the court to register you as an independent political party. Because the Chinese constitution does not explicitly ban political parties. And if you, the courts are really powerful, you can go to the court and block the local government from taking away your land or your property. So in, in that case, uh, but in these instances, you clearly see a clear risk of the rule of law. Nationalism. Uh, in the, uh, this was mainly a phenomenon of the 1990s. Uh, 
Uh, that's because after the collapse of the former Soviet Union, after Tiananmen, the Chinese government uh, deliberately uh, uh, implemented a program to encourage nationalism. Uh, textbooks, monuments, various programs, and uh, it reached a peak uh, about four or five years ago uh, when China and Japan got into a very nasty uh, spiral of uh, deterioration of relations. Uh, but all of a sudden, the government found that nationalism could cut both ways because the people who were very angry about Japan broke, uh, started out demonstrations, and the government said, oh my gosh, uh, uh, the, the, first thing, the, uh, the first slogan they are going to shout is down with the Japanese, the second is down with the Communist Party, so I think you've got to s stop them from saying the first thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no seconds. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pei, for speaking to us today. Um, my question may be going even further into the hypothetical, but um, assuming we have a democratizing, if not democratic, China, how do you see that, given what you said about dealing with groups that might not want to be under Beijing's control, how do you see that affecting cross-strait relations? It will be a positive development for the relationship between China and Taiwan. Uh, because if I were Taiwanese, uh, uh, having lived outside China for so long, I've acquired the ability to think in the shoes of other people. So when they talk about the Tibetans, I think like Tibetans. When they talk about Taiwanese, I think like Tibetans. Uh, if I were Taiwanese, I really don't want to be part of a country that is governed by a one-party system. So I think that at least will provide the political basis for starting a dialogue regarding the end game, whether reunification or uh, political separation. So I, uh, but it depends on who is in charge in Taiwan. Because as I said, the moment of democracy is the most vulnerable moment for the Chinese state. And if there's domestic chaos in China, and we cannot rule that out, and the Tibetans are breaking out that uh, uh, the Muslims are breaking out, and if Taiwan was controlled, were, to, uh, were controlled by the Democratic Progressive Party, the pro-independence party, and it wants to use that moment to seek its own breakout, then you are looking at a major war. So, uh, but if, say, the transition in China from dictatorship to uh, democracy is orderly, then the peaceful resolution of, Taiwan, of the Taiwan issue is much more promising. Let's take some more questions. Um, yeah, I'm Yang, and I come from what is possibly the last shining beacon of authoritarianism in the world, Singapore. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, and most commentators would agree that Singapore is only a democracy in name, and really a de facto authoritarian regime. And yet, it's, it would appear to me and to many other political commentators that our, our authoritarian regime still has a long way to go. And I think part of the reason, if we, if we use your framework, is that our government seems to be pretty successful in maintaining high rates of economic growth, despite our import exports being three times our GDP. So. Global, so the freedom, economic freedom is not in itself, uh, the, the vulnerability is not in itself a uh, hindrance. And that two, we have institutionalized corruption. So our ministers, my prime minister is paid $3 million a year, which I believe is six times more than the US president. So the, our government's argument for that is that if you have that much money, you wouldn't be corrupt. <laughs> and the third is, or we have a, a very intricate system of co-opting the elite of the elite. And so, in a sense, not, uh, not all the elites are co-opted into the government, but the most pernicious ones are, which are the creme de la creme. And the fourth is that, for some reason, most of, my, most of the upper middle class and middle class in Singapore seem to be very politically apathetic. 
So a sense of there is a there is an increasing sense of civic activism, but only enough to pressure the government to increase individual freedoms, but not necessarily political democracy. So do you think that Singapore that ha provides lessons for the Chinese Communist Party to remain in power just by incre just by following what we have done? Yeah. Something they've got to shrink China from 1.3 yeah. million uh, <laughs> billion to roughly three million. I think that would take a gigantic shrinking machine to do. Uh, Incidentally, Deng Xiaoping himself, the father of Chinese modernization, was so inspired by the Singaporean experience. Uh, I'm reading history of Chinese reform, and he mentioned he visited Singapore, was very impressed, and talked about you uh, moving the Singapore experience to China. Uh, but I think the, today, uh, the Chinese government will look at very specific policies of Singapore. Public housing in Singapore is very successful. So they are looking at that aspect. And uh, they also looked at increasing the pay for uh, government officials. They finally concluded it would not work because uh, the, pay, uh, uh, the corruption income on the side is much bigger in China. Uh, Singapore is a very interesting case. I've, I've lived in Singapore. I've studied uh, its politics. What I found that it's a uh, very clever way of self-discipline. Uh, the question I often ask is why the Singaporean elites are not corrupt, other than getting $3 million uh, uh, a year for the prime minister. Uh, actually, the Singaporean ruling party called the People's Action Party uh, have, uh, has built in a relatively clean election process, even though it rigs the system the pro election process is quite clean. So every four years, it has to answer to the voters. And that way, it keeps itself, it's a, it keeps itself uh, uh, restrained uh, by this device. Uh, as far as Singapore is concerned, I would say that uh, the experience of a city-state is inherently limiting. Uh, because New York, New York is really run like a dictatorship. If you look at Mayor Bloomberg's power, enormous power, uh, and people are very happy with uh, Bloomberg. If as long as he's keeping the streets clean, he's uh, 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 <laughs> uh, he's uh, sort of uh, uh, keeping uh, the, the city safe, very not that different from the Singaporean government. But I think the key in Singapore is really e economic performance. Uh, I cannot imagine PAP in power if Singapore goes into a 10-year economic slump. Because this machine, this elaborate machine of patronage uh, will unravel when you have 10-year economic slump, or even five years. Uh, I, I, think the, I think the evidence for your theoretical criticism of the idea that uh, economic development and democracy sort of normally go together is much stronger uh, that theory is an ideology. It doesn't really work even in the West. Democracies in the West were formed because of religious wars between Protestants and Catholics. We forget, for instance, that in the 16th century, there are 40 years of civil war in France in which between two and four million people were killed. It, given that kind of conflict, Western civilization, very different from other societies because of the need to have this religious area that you couldn't impose religion. Then industrialization began. But large-scale industrialization has always weakened democracy in the West. The United States, the Gilded Age in the late 19th century, this is a time when Mark Hanna, the oil industry, they ran the country. It was less democratic. Nazi Germany, France under Pétain, Italy with fascism, Spain. Again and again, we see when you try and introduce large-scale industrial society, dem democratic societies are weaker. Thank you. I will use that in my next talk. <laughs> because uh, my experience being limited to developing countries. Uh, and uh, you, uh, uh, so I draw my examples from East Asia, Africa, Latin America. And now you've given me the examples of the developed West. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.